All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the uh, 10th day of September in the year of our Lord, 2024. A time to uh, kick some sacred cows. And I've had to examine myself a little bit. Am I, why am I doing this? Am I doing it just to get viewers? Or because there, there's nothing like trying to take down some big figure, you know? I'm not actually trying to take anyone down, but... Uh, a Christian, because we can act out of the flesh, very easy to do it. Uh, we need to examine ourselves. Am I doing it for the wrong reason? Or am I doing it out of concern and love for Christ and Christ's purpose of saving sinners? Am I doing it for the gospel? And I have to answer that in the affirmative. Uh, people out there think Christianity is all about being nice Read Paul's letter to the Galatians. You need to read that anyway, because this is a deadly serious matter. Every pastor needs to read that probably a couple times a year because it is so tempting. And I'm not serving in that capacity as a pastor anymore. I thank God. I have no desire to do that. If God tells me to do it, well, that's up to him, but it's like nothing I particularly wanted to. Um... Every once in a while, the temptation comes along. Uh, then I remember, no, that's not going to work. Especially when you make compromises. And uh, have try to, you know, you have churches out there, many churches that are struggling. And, you know, you feel the mommy instinct, I guess, the daddy instinct. Come in and save them. Uh, help them. But they need to be saved. Uh, our unregenerate church is uh, an abomination. Uh, I mean, oh, I feel compassion for them, but unless they, you cannot save a group anyway. There is no mass, you know, it's, it's individual. God deals with you individually. Uh, and that's part of the problem here. So, I'm going to kick a sacred cow called Franklin Graham and Samaritan's Purse. Or his whole ministry outfit, really. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about, there, there's, there's quite a few uh, people. Uh, there's actually people commenting on all these people coming to Christ. These celebrities. Uh, and I, had, I don't follow them. I remember Condi Rice, and I, and I remember, or not Condi Rice. Uh, Condé West. God, he writes, I don't think so. Uh, his conversion to Christ, and it was like, yeah, we'll wait and see. I don't know. I haven't tracked him. I I think uh, I've heard noise, a little noise out there the other day that in passing that uh, it didn't go so well. I don't know. I don't know. Um, see, people can come fall in love with the idea of. Christian theology, or the idea of a Christian civilization, uh, the idea of Christian ethics. It's like uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, loved Jesus' ethics, but didn't accept Christ's deity or his miracles, so he cut all that stuff out of his Jeffersonian Bible, all the supernatural stuff, because he thought it was bunk. So he reduced Jesus to a uh, uh, like Buddha or somebody, a, uh, a philosopher, uh, an ethical teacher. Well, yeah, of course. See, if you're a sinful human being, like Jefferson was, all people are born sinful human beings, you don't want to be confronted by God. You don't want a Messiah, a the Son of God, 
appearing on earth and proving that he is the son of God and then rising from the dead. Ethical teachers aren't threatening to the dominion of self. Self is going to keep its throne. Christ is going to demand that you kneel to him. And any Christianity that doesn't tell you that is a false gospel. You must submit yourself to Christ in order to be saved. He said, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to rule my life the way I want. I'm going to do, live my life the way I want. But I, I want Jesus to take me to heaven because I don't like the, the idea of that other place. Well, so I'm a rebel and I want to be a rebel. I don't want to be saved from my sin, just the consequences of my sin. The, what's called the church is full of it. Fundamental Baptist churches are full of people like that. Southern Baptists even more so. And that's part of what I'm going to uh, talk about with Franklin Graham and Samaritan's Purse. The same applies to Billy Graham. Okay, so we have these people like uh, uh, Elon Musk and uh, Jordan Peterson and Condi uh, Owens, Candace Owens, excuse me, Candace Owens, uh, these rather celebrity pick people, people that um, have made a name for themselves in sort of confronting the nonsense, like the wokeism and everything else, uh, and paid a price for it. And so if they make any noises that make it sound like they're attracted to Christianity or or say that their wife's becoming a Catholic or something like that, uh, people just say, oh, wow, they're Christians now. But does God say they're Christians? What's he identifying? The, uh, the, the, uh, the fact of Christianity is Christ in you. If the, if the living Christ, the spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God does not actually dwell in you, and you're, this is not simply a doctrine. Paul expects you to be able to recognize that. If he doesn't dwell in you, you don't belong to him. And if you don't belong to Christ, you're not saved. It's like there, there's many out there who absolutely reject the idea uh, that Christ is, is Lord. Well, you don't make him Lord to be saved. You you kneel to him as Lord because you have been saved. Okay, so th this is a matter of re of of, of uh, repentance, conversion, and regeneration, real con real salvation. Becoming a Christian is God's work, not yours. He initiates it, not you. He calls, and you can answer or you can close your ears to him. But it's like being red pilled. That's a fairly good analogy. It won't be pleasant. Conversion is a, a, a traumatic experience. It is a crisis experience. You are confronted with your own evil. That's what repentance. Uh, when the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin and of righteousness and of judgment, which is his mission. You'll know the truth about yourself, and you can either run away, or you can, out of that, out of realizing what you really are, you can cry out to God for salvation. God, save me from myself. See, many people want God to save them from the consequences of their sin. But they don't want to save, don't want God to save them from their real problem, which is the, the tyranny of self in you. Me. I need to be saved from me, from myself, from my rebellion against God, from my spiritual bankruptcy. And until you are confronted with that reality by God because self runs from it. Self exalts itself. That's the nature of it, of sinful humanity is, is the spirit of Antichrist. 
It exalts itself over God. Every time you disobey God, you're exalting yourself over him. You're declaring that you're Lord, not him. And that is the first step in salvation. You cry out to God to save you, no, being exposed to what you are. You realize what you are. You realize your need. You realize your spiritual bankruptcy. You realize you justly deserve hell. Justly deserve it. And you cry out to him and his grace to save you from it. The Holy Spirit will bear witness that Christ was crucified for your sins. Now, this might not be all... Uh, mentally evident to you at the time, but this was what goes through. And when you believe that Christ died for your sins, it's God's will that God desires you to be saved. God provided the atonement for all your sins. And when you believe that, you're justified. Because you've trusted in Christ's work. And then, you're, then you are regenerated. And I'm not going to get into arguments about order here. It's a package deal. It's not about what you want, it's what God wants. And it's a supernatural work of God in you. And God puts a new spirit in you, a new heart in you. A, he puts his spirit in you. Uh, you become one spirit with him. You're forgiven all your sins, past, present, and future, because it's in Christ. As long as you're in Christ, you're, you're under his atonement. Given saving uh, a kind of faith that is not natural faith, but a supernatural faith, the faith of Christ, does all kinds of things. The promises of the new covenant, what Jesus died on the cross to purchase for us. This is the blood of the new covenant. Isn't that what we're supposed to remember? What Christ did for us at communion? And so this is self, true salvation is God's work. So, uh, but, but I, I read people's biographies sometimes, and you know, some question comes up with, because there's lots of Christians. People th think they're Christians, believe they're Christians, are told they're Christians, are celebrated as Christians, and they're not, because they haven't come through the right door. The narrow door, which is Christ. Few find it because they don't want it. It's not pleasant to be confronted with your ugliness and your sin and your the just rewards for that sin by God. People tend, your self wants to flee, just like Adam and Eve hid themselves from God made garments of fig leaves to cover their nakedness. That's the nakedness they felt because of their sin. It wasn't, it wasn't physical. That wasn't the issue. They felt naked. Because they spiritually were. And so these, these people that are coming and sort of, they're, they're, well, if you've ever read Pilgrim's Progress, there's a lot of characters in that, in that uh, uh, story like this. People that just sort of stumble into Christianity. They don't come through the right gate. They don't come through Christ. They don't come through uh, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, in, in, uh, in, this, in uh, Pilgrim's Progress, that, that uh, story... Um, allegory. Uh, Pilgrim didn't actually come to Christ truly until he encountered himself and his condemnation and the cross. He was still bearing his burden when he when he went through the gate. That is Christ. It wasn't until he came to the cross that he was set free of that burden, and that's. And that's an analogy. That book is a, a an allegory of the Christian of the Christian life, according to John Bunyan, a famous 
famous, uh, well, the kind of Christian I am, I think. Not quite that great, but... Uh, of course, you actually read uh, his his uh, biography, his personal account. Uh, he doesn't see himself in very high light. Uh, but, yeah, that, that's the uh, second greatest English uh, book as far as historic sales is Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, it's, it's, it's not scripture, but it is certainly an edifying book. Don't buy the modern text version. <laughs> it's worth the trouble. It's like uh, Paradise Lost. Uh, a modernized version ain't, ain't going to work. It's, it's worth struggling through a, a little bit of archaic language. You'll pick it up in, within a, a week or so. Just reading it, you'll learn how to read it. So it's worth it. But it, it's uh, this is how people come to Christ. There's, there is a crisis experience. It can vary. You know, you shouldn't say, well, this is how it happened with you and there, in, in specific ways, and therefore that's what must happen with me. No, but you will be convicted of your sin by the Holy Spirit. And you will be by, uh, br drawn by the Spirit to Christ. Jesus says, no one comes to me unless the Father draws him. And that's true. See, salvation is God's work. God initiates... Uh, uh, God... Uh, what is, not initializes it. <laughs> initiates it. It's, he begins it. He draws you. And he finishes it. Your role in it is whether you're going to run away or let God do what God desires to do. And when you're, conf when you're convicted of your sins, hopefully you'll become desperate enough to, to uh, do what you don't want to do, which is to kneel to Christ, to surrender to Christ. There is some surrendering in that because you're no longer going to be the Lord of your life. See, as a sinner, you are in the throne of your life. You are the master. What was that uh, poem? Invictus. I am something like, I am the captain of my soul. I am the master of my destiny. That is the most wicked, satanic uh, poem I've ever read. That is the words of Satan, essentially. I will rule my life. You know, how many people out there say, it is my body, I will do what it, I want with it. No, it's God's. He's lent it to you. It's not yours to do what you want with. That demonstrates... You are lost. That attitude, that defiant attitude that, that I'm, I'm my own boss. God's not going to tell me what to do. Proves that you do, you're not saved. See, that's why you need a new heart. The flesh that has that attitude is still there, by the way. You have to be, you have to be careful of that. Because it will always want to try to assert itself, to, to recapture its throne, to rule over you. But Christ is in you also. See, Christians can walk in the flesh or we can walk in the spirit. You walk in the spirit by faith, not by some charismatic thingy speaking in so-called tongues, which is just gibberish, by the way. Yeah. How do I know? Well, I used to do it. But I'll take cards and linguistics and say, hmm, that's interesting. That stuff is not a language. You know, it's easy to prove. I mean, that this is, you, could, you simply, nobody wants to do it. See, they, they don't want to subject their experience to actual tests. Just like Christianity. Christians don't want to Ob uh, subject their experience or their faith to the scriptural tests. You know, what the apostles say, What like John, what does John say in 1 John? I've written these things that you might, might know that you have eternal life. 
Well, there's a lot of Christians out that say, oh, if I read the book, then uh, the, the, the theology here means I have eternal life. No. John gives a number of tests in there and said, do you do this or do you do that? So that the difference between what a saved person, a true Christian is, and what a person that's not a true Christian is, that, that's pretty much the, the subject of 1 John. So that's the problem, and pastors, and, and I've done this, so, you know, the temptation is to not make people upset, to not speak the truth, especially the truth about your own congregation, or the truth about people in your congregation. Of course, you usually don't do it by name, uh, but obviously other they'll know <laughs> Others will know. But it, it, it will not go over well. Because people don't like it. They don't want to be confronted with the truth. They like lies. They like comfort. That's why they love Joel Bo Osteen. His, 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 his gospel will damn you to hell. Because it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Any gospel other than Jesus Christ. Christ crucified for our sins. Christ risen from the dead. And that atonement given to those who surrender to God, surrender to Christ, who come to him and call out to him to save us, who are born again by the Spirit of God, regenerated, made new creatures in Christ. Without that, you're not really a Christian. You may be hanging around the edge. You might be camp followers in the armies of, you know, like the Civil War, there or other historically, there'd be a whole mobs of people that would follow the army around uh, because they wanted money. They would provide services of various kinds, you know, for the soldiers. You go to an army base, and there's usually outside of one of the gates a whole street full of shops, uh, laundry services, bars, other kinds of services whatever they can get away with, to, to get money. Because they had all these, uh, these uh, lonely men that are away from home, you know, that have all these different needs. Often it was, uh, like the Civil War, it might be a, a woman baking uh, uh, special treats, you know, little cakes or pies or something like that, or laundry services and other things that, that uh, the soldiers would rather not do themselves. So. They're camp followers. They're not the army. There's a lot of Christianity's got a lot of camp followers. People that might be attracted to it. So it's, so it's like as I was mentioning, uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, Elon Musk was talking about he he loves the idea of Christianity. Peterson, you know, some of these people might be the, the Holy Spirit might be drawing them in, but they're not there yet. So I, I'm not saying reject them. I'm saying pray for them. Be hopeful. Or as Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. It'll take time. It'll, it'll come out. Are they real or not? Uh, Jordan Peterson, I was listening to something he was saying the other day about, well, I don't know how old it was. It wasn't real old. About uh, He was talking about the, the the image of the harlot in the book of Revelation in regard to something. A man, he went off in crazy world, like some Jungian archetypal image of women and their and their the the, uh, the, the, the the they're they're using sex to manipulate people and it's like that is not what it's about. But he's he's got a whole series on his YouTube channel about uh, the psychological significance of biblical imagery. It's like, no! See, he, he, he does not yet understand. He has not been born again yet. And there's no evidence, there's no record uh, there of uh, him having a, a, a born again the, the, the experience uh, the, uh, of being confronted with his sin 
and coming to, to Christ crucified to forgive him. It's not a casual thing. It's radically transforming, and it's, it's painful because it involves the crucifixion of yourself. Not the death, it's unfortunately yet, but it is yourself, your, uh, what Freud would call your ego, doesn't want, it's in control and doesn't want to give up control. You're self-centered rather than God-centered. And there's a lot of Christians that, that think that, well, I can be self-centered and, and still have God in my life. Yeah, but God won't have you in his life. Yeah, the, the flesh is still there. There are carnal Christians. Uh, Paul talks about you're still babes. You're like newborn babes or little children, toddlers. You're, you're dominated by the flesh. The Spirit of God is there. The, the, the new life is there, but it's, it's so small relevant to, relative to the rest of you. See, you say, when, I was saved when I was just about 21. So I had 21 years of growing up into a young man in the flesh. And I'm a newborn baby in the spirit. Is Christ in me? Yes. But a lot of me was still there too. A lot, and it's how much of the time are you in charge rather than Christ? You have to learn. You have to learn to walk by faith and not by sight, not by the flesh. Walking by faith is walking by faith. Uh, walking in the spirit is walking by faith. Trusting in God rather than trusting in your ability or the world or the insurance company or something like that. You know, it's trusting in Christ. And most Christians never learn to do that. Maybe because they're never born again. And that, that is my great fear that you see all these people as, as, you know, as a pastor. It's like, are these people really saved? They believe they are, but they don't really act like it. So it's, it's like uh, uh, Elon Musk is not a Christian yet. Donald Trump is not a Christian yet. He has never, to this day, as far as I know, he doesn't say about, he doesn't confess to asking for even forgiveness, which most Christians from their youth, from the time they were tiny children, they were taught to pray, forgive me my sins, nightly or whatever it was. For to say the Lord's Prayer, you know. Donald Trump doesn't even have a sign of being a Christian. Have a, adopting the, the trappings of Christianity, like holding up a Bible or having a Christmas tree or calling, calling yourself a Christian, does not make you a Christian. Seeing the advantages of having uh, somewhat of a Christian-influenced society, having a basis for right and wrong, and a basis for law. Seeing the advantage of that to, compared to atheism and nihilism, which is where the world is today, functional atheism, nihilism, uh, existentialism, where you, you don't believe that there is a truth out there, it's all subjective including gender, subjective. And who is anybody else to, to uh, refute your truth? It's the absolute supremacy of self, unleashed from any restraint. That's what the, the, uh, this transgenderism is a manifestation of that. And I think uh, Jordan Peterson would agree with me. I just have to educate him in the spiritual aspect of these things. Yeah, he's a he's you know he really knows his, his psychotherapy and that, but much more than I just had one semester of that. That was more than enough. It's like, hey, these these you have Jung and Freud and Maslow and all these other dudes, and none of them agree with each other. It's like, hmm, what truth is this? And when I took that, I was a Christian. I was a born again believer. So, but I was. Even, you know, I was 
brand new, but I still know this is nonsense. But that's, a, you know, a new believer, they, they can, it's not that they lack strength. They just lack experience. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a school of hard knocks. Uh, Jesus said, I am the, the, you know, he is the way. So you have to enter by the narrow gate, and then there's a narrow way. The way is narrow in the sense that it is, well, first of all, the gate is small, and the way is narrow because it's Christ. The gate is Christ, and the way is Christ. But it's, uh, it's, it's like a, the word there in the Greek means like constraint like a narrow path along a, a ridge or or something like that. And it's, it's both sides are not very good. Uh, you're, you're, you're hit, or trying to squeeze between two large rocks, you know, as you're going down a narrow trail. That That's what the kind of way he means. A way that it's difficult, it's not easy. And it can contrast that to the easy way, the broad way, the, the super highway. You know, it's like going down a, a narrow, twisty gravel road through the mountains as opposed to and keep trying to keep your car on the road because of the cliff on one side and the precipice on the other uh, compared to a, a uh, eight-lane super highway with minimal traffic. <laughs> Actually, there's a lot of traffic on it uh, because that's the way of the world. But the one way, the narrow way, leads to life. The other way leads to destruction. That's fact. Now, most people, most, Jesus said, few are those that find the way. The way is him. In fact, early Christians, one of the names they used for themselves, they didn't call themselves Christians. That's what the world called, came to call them. They called themselves, for one of the things, the followers of the way. Who's the way? Christ is the way. So we have these um, hopeful Christians hopefully will become Christians. But many of them won't. Many of them, when they're confronted with the reality of, of the demands of Christ to, to surrender to him as Lord, there's a whole lot of people out there that teach that that's terrible. That's a false gospel. You're not saved by surrendering. God calls you, convicts you. And once you're confronted, when you're finally confronted with, with that, with the conviction of the Holy Spirit, uh, you will be willing. You become willing. You become desperate to escape, to be liberated from your sin and its consequences. The, the problem is not, the, the, it's not uh, save me from hell. Save me from myself. I deserve hell. Save me from myself. You realize the depths of he, the fall you're just a son of Adam or daughter of Adam. You need to be saved. Okay. Where am I? Okay, 33 minutes. Okay. So we have to be careful with some of these people. Civilizational Christianity, the trappings of Christianity, or the, 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 uh, the benefits of being in the shade of Christianity is not Christianity. It's like the camp followers. They're not the army. But they do benefit from the army. So, there are an awful lot of... Uh, most of what's called Christianity is not genuine biblical Christianity. Is not the Christianity of Jesus and the apostles. It's just fact. It's a fact. Roman Catholicism is not that Christianity. It's mostly man-made. It comes, it, it, you know, there's a whole sequence of how it came about. And East, and Orthodoxy too. Which came, Orthodoxy came first. But you're, you're talking hundreds of years removed. You're talking after it became state religion. State religion is never, ever, ever real Christianity. Because real Christianity is a relationship between you and God in Christ. It's about personal, individual salvation. There is no national salvation. It's a lie. You're the one that God will judge for your sins. Your sins are the problem, not the sins of society, your sins. 
Your evil is the problem. Your acts are the problem. The fact that you practice sin and love sin and refuse to bow before Christ. That, that, that is a great sin, rejecting God's salvation. That's the unforgivable sin. Because you've rejected the only basis for forgiveness. And forgiveness alone is not enough because the problem is not just what you've done. The problem is you yourself, the one who does the, the sin. You are the bad tree that bears bad fruit. Fruit is just the, the, the evidence of what you are. Okay, so you got to be careful with uh, celebrity Christians anyway. And the sacred cow I'm going to kick, again, is Franklin Graham and, well, Billy Graham by, by extension. Billy Graham, uh, I remember reading his biography, and I found it rather disturbing. Billy Graham, in his biography, and, and he uh, also talks, this was not a hostile, for, I think the title was something like A Prophet with Honor, which is, well, Jesus said that, that no prophet is uh, uh, a prophet among his own people has, is, is not honored. A, a prophet of God is not honored by those God sends him to. He's despised because he's exposing their sin. That's what prophets did. They brought the bad news, mostly. God didn't send prophets unless it got pretty bad. Okay, so uh, Billy Graham, as I was going through his biography, and I remember as a, as a pastor, too, you know, you, you want a, a new pastor or something, you want to sort of emulate you know, what you think of as a, as, a, as a preacher. I remember going back and carefully analyzing some of uh, Graham's sermons. I thought, hmm, okay, what's this? This isn't preaching Christ and Christ crucified. This isn't the gospel. And his, uh, his techniques, I, I, I saw him employing in his uh, crusades, of course, these were all available on video, you know. Uh, psychological uh, manipulative techniques, trying to get a certain response. So in Billy Graham's uh, theology, uh, which was called, he had a magazine called Decision Magazine. So his theology is one of decisionism, typical Southern Baptist stuff. So you make a decision for Christ. It's a human thing. It, it, uh, Billy Graham was a big fan of Charles Finney, uh, a evangelist of the so-called Second Great Awakening, which wasn't a Great Awakening at all. And Finney, it, it's all about you and your righteousness. It was semi-holiness kind of, well, it was holiness, but not the Wesleyan kind, but Wesley had the same kind of ideas, that you have to make yourself holy in order, uh, uh, and you have to be accepted in your own holiness before God. You stand in your holiness, your personal holiness, your personal deeds, and you're judged on that basis and accepted or lost. That is, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, what the Islam, uh, Muslims believe. The, the scale and balances. How many Christians have you heard that? Well, I think my good deeds outweigh my bad. Well, then you're toast. Because they don't, for one thing. Uh, if you're still a, a rebel against Christ, you're, does he own you? Are you his property? He bought you with his blood. Don't you understand that? I'm not saying anything the scriptures don't. Why don't you read Paul? You don't like to read the Bible, do you? Unless you spin it in such a way that you look for the verses that please you rather than the ones that don't please you. That's the flash. Okay, so uh, Billy Graham, uh, in his, what was, I noticed in his biography, there was no, uh, his, his uh, salvation account is that he, he went to a uh, camp meeting, a revival. You know, the revival is traveling around, like Billy Graham did, only on a, a grand scale. 
uh, in their tents. Uh, and the guy was Mordecai something or other. Anyway, this re the revivalist he went to was not the kind of person. He was a, a member uh, and advocate of the Ku Klux Klan, I believe, and some other things that were indicate he was not a born-again Christian either. Nobody could be a Klan member and be a born-again Christian. I mean, they're, they're not compatible. They're absolutely, following Jesus is not being a member of the Ku Klux Klan. You know, you can't be a member of the Ku Klux Klan and a member of, and, of Jesus' church. I hope everybody can understand that. Uh, like a well, you know, there's but there's fake churches that you know the the Klan declares themselves to be Christian. They've always presented themselves as, uh, uh, with fl American flags and crosses, and you know, you know, lovers of the uh, baseball and apple pie, as the true Americans. That's what they they claim to be when in their heyday, especially back in the. Uh, first half of the 20th century, the 20s and 30s, when my grandfather's was a member of the Klan for a while. He was not a stupid man, though. He uh, eventually realized that this was not the place to be. He was a Mason for a while, too. Then realized, no, that we can be swept along with the, uh, the winds of culture as Christians. But God will... Uh, keep us from getting swept completely away. We <laughs> recover us. Hey, dummy, come back here. He'll call us back to himself. And then we'll realize, oh, how stupid I am. That's a common experience. Oh, how stupid I am. <laughs> okay, so, but his, his conversion experience, so he goes to this revival meeting and him, he and a buddy, and they sort of just went forward, if I recall, as as like, hey, let, let's just do this, you know. Just show that this is nonsense. And then later at night, he he suddenly realized that he did believe the gospel. Or whatever this guy was preaching, I don't know. But there was nothing in there about Graham coming to a conviction of his sinfulness which is the work of the Holy Spirit. Without the work of the Holy Spirit, you cannot be saved. It's impossible. You cannot be saved through human reason. No, you could, you could, uh, you could believe the ideas of Christianity. You could believe the theology. You could believe the logic of it. But that's not salvation. That's not saving faith. Faith is a, a saving faith is, is about trusting in Christ. It is about his trusting him to lead you, to save you. It is not simply intellectual belief. It is trust. It's like entering into a marriage. It's a, a commitment of trust. Well, it is. In the Bible, Jesus is the bridegroom, and the church is the bride. It's that kind of relationship. It's a covenant relationship. But God is the one, in the new covenant, God is the one who is active. God says, I will do this. I will give you a new heart. I will forgive your sins. I will put a new spirit in you. I will bless you. I'll do all these things, the promises of the new covenant. It's all God's acts, unconditional, to those who come to him to be saved by him from their sin, from themselves. It's not your deeds, it's yourself. Who, what produces those deeds? Comes out of your flesh. Comes out of you. God has to do a, a complete overhaul. But the flesh is still there. We still live in this world, in these mortal bodies. Till Christ returns. So that there was a lack. And I said, wait a minute. Wait, and, and again, what I experienced is what the Bible teaches. I didn't know that at the time, but looking back over it, especially now it's, uh, what, 48? 48 years I've been a Christian? Yeah. 48 years. 
I looked back over that, and that, yeah, everything that happened was biblical. Completely biblical. So even though the, the details of what happened to me were unique between God and me, the general pattern is completely biblical. God saves us individually. And the circumstances and everything else are individual. But the conviction of sin, of righteousness and judgment, the Holy Spirit, uh, the calling of God, uh, to and the, the, the Father brings you to the Son, say, here, this is my salvation, Christ crucified for your sins. And if you believe that, you're justified. But Paul said, with the heart one believes unto justification, and then with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. He that confesses before me before men, I will confess before the angels of my Father. Let them know you're one of mine. That is the proper role of baptism, although baptism is does not, you know, not the only way to confess Christ. Okay, so then you had Billy Graham. Okay, okay, this is all his biography, a, a prophet with honor, which in itself is con uh, uh, contrary to the Bible. <clears throat> prophet only has honor outside of his own country and away from his own people. Yeah. Then he'd be honored there. But some things just don't add up in some of these biographies. It's like, wait a minute. So he has this, this experience and then he then he comes to the, to the idea, well, I do believe. Well, that sounds like John Wesley. And if anybody's read Wesley's stuff, you know that he was unstable. He would believe, and he wouldn't believe, and he'd believe, and he'd go off into all kinds of weird stuff. Why did he go off into this? To, you know, he was uh, he was into definitely into religion before that, and he had several conversion experiences. But he was an un, unstable man, and he's always, you know, his uh, his his own doctrines were an abomination. The Christian perfectionism, and he also is one like Charles Finney said, "You stand, you will stand in your own righteousness before God." Well, that is anti-gospel. No, you stand in Christ's righteousness. It's what Christ did on the cross. That's what matters. Are you in Christ? Are you in His atonement? Are you covered by His blood? If you're standing in your own righteousness, even in part, this is the message of the letter of Paul to the Galatians. If you are putting trust in your own deeds or in your works of law, your obedience to God's commandments, even in part, if it's grace plus works, you're damned. Christ will be of no benefit to you, Paul says. You've cut yourself off from Christ by self-reliance, even in part. You don't believe me? Read Paul. If you don't believe Paul, you are not a Christian. People gather teachers around themselves according to their desires. That is a problem. Because there's things that God is saying to you you don't want to hear. Why do you think they crucified Jesus? Why do you think they tried to stone him? Repeatedly. Because he was telling them the truth and they didn't want to hear it. He was speaking the truth in love. Because God desires all people to be saved. And self was reacting against that. Because he was convicting them of their sins. The fact that they don't have any righteousness. Nothing that'll please God. Okay, so if we we, we run into, into these characters that are highly regarded as Christians, Mother Teresa is another one. There's another sacred cow. 
Well, I guess that's a double thing there, isn't it? Considering where her ministry was. But if you do some research, you'll find out what she really was doing was promoting herself. And the people, she was not helping anyone. And the locals held her in low esteem. It's a fraud. And it's been revealed in her personal letters to someone that she confessed she never knew Christ. And indeed, it's true. It was all about works. And, and how she abused the nuns that flocked to her. It was all about us suffering to atone for our sins, not Christ's suffering. It was a false gospel. Oh, but she did all this great... No, she didn't. She helped multitudes on their way to hell. She comforted dying Hindus, but refused to share the gospel with them. She was just like Pope Francis. She was a universalist. What kind of comfort is it when somebody comes to you and, and you're dying and you're lost and you're afraid to die because of your sins, somebody comes to you and says, God accepts you just as you are. God loves you just as you are. You are completely accepted. God accepts everyone. God is love. To ease your fall into the pit. Last minute deception doesn't tell you that you can be saved and forgiven from all your sins by trusting in Christ and his righteousness, by trusting in Christ dying for your sins. For he died for the sins of the whole world. And we're saved through faith in Christ and that alone. No, she didn't believe that. Catholics don't believe that. There are some Catholics that do. But Catholic theology is, opposes that. I wish all Catholics believed the truth. I wish all Muslims believed the truth. God desires them all to believe the truth. Telling them pleasant lies is not helpful. So here, but Graham develops, uh, after being baptized several times... <laughs> In fact, here's an example of, of something from Billy Graham's uh, biography. It's not autobiography, but it's biography. And as again, it's, it's a friendly biography. That Graham, uh, because he wanted to join the Southern Baptists because they were the largest Baptist group, but actually his family was Presbyterian, I believe. Uh, his wife, was I think, remained Presbyterian. But uh, revivalism, and so the, the largest group that was doing this was the Southern Baptists, and, well. So uh, he had been baptized by immersion. He was baptized as a baby and that, uh, because of his uh, family. And then he was, when he was going, he was, went to, originally to Bob Jones, uh, which what became Bob Jones University, Bob Jones Bible College. And uh, he didn't like that because it was sort of strict. I wouldn't. I I would not tolerate Bob Jones for a moment. I mean, I I just stand up and say this is not Bible. I'd be out of there. I, I once investigated a fundamentalist Baptist college, and I, I went in there, and of course I was I was not a child. I was I was not an eighteen year old, just out of high school. So I, I get there and. And walking, you know, there they had a, a one of the kind of open house things they have universities and colleges have. So it was a small college in Watertown, Wisconsin, a Maranatha Bible College, and uh, I don't know if they've changed their name or not, but that's what it was. <clears throat> and actually, I've known several pastors that went there, but uh, so I'm there and it was relatively close to where I lived. Close enough I could commute long distance, but eh, not much farther than what I was commuting to Madison. Uh, 
But so I, I went there and investigated the possibility of, of going uh, to school there and becoming a pastor or something. And I was thinking, this place is full of kids. And they, they were all cookie cuttered. It's like, tum, tum, tum. I'm too much of a rebel, rebel against the world. Yeah. Well, if you're a child of God, you're going to be a rebel against the world. Just as the way it is. You're in a different kingdom. Like the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the world is at war with each other. Haven't you noticed? But Billy Graham, so back to the baptism. So he had been baptized. He, he left uh, Bob Jones and went down to a, a church in Florida. I can't re remember the name of it. That was um, not uh, as fundamentalist. Uh, you know, the strict third separation degree fundamentalist of Bob Jones. Yeah, <clears throat> Bob Jones is a bit of a tyrant. But uh, uh, they're slowly moderating. They actually got in trouble with the, uh, the what was it, the uh, IRS and lost their tax exempt status for a while because they had a policy against interracial dating. Well, which has no biblical basis, but even though the court recognized it was a sincerely held religious belief, it says it's contrary to government policy, and therefore you don't get your tax-exempt status, which should be a warning to everybody who tries to go tax-exempt. The government can just say, well, that's contrary to our public policy. Like today, we know what the public policy of the United States is in regard to, to certain sexual ethics and marriages. So that they could just strip you of your tax exempt status at will. They've already got Supreme Court precedent. Did you know that? This was back in 19, uh, about, around the mid 80s that they lost it. So they lost the case at the Supreme Court. And they, they'd had to change the policy, but uh, they should have just had a policy against students dating altogether, maybe. I've been in schools that had that, or they, that you couldn't date until your senior year or something. Um, it's supposed to be there for some other reason. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. They're probably better off uh, if they find somebody, that, a, a Christian, a good Christian that loves the Lord. Marry them and leave the cotton pick in school. That would be the best plan. Go serve, go start a family and serve the Lord that way. Uh rather than enter into a uh, corrupted church structure that's not biblical. It doesn't really serve the Lord. But Graham, because he, he wanted to go to the, the Southern Baptist, because that was the biggest opportunity, that was the, the, the field where we'd have the biggest chances of, of being successful on a large scale, he already had visions of grandeur, apparently. He wanted to be a revivalist. So I think he had started some of it, but he wanted to get into it where there's more opportunity and more support. And the Southern Baptists, basically, he was told, well, they'd be more amenable uh, to cooperating with you and supporting you if you were baptized as a Southern Baptist. So he had been baptized as an infant. Then he was baptized uh, down in Sarasota, I believe it was, Florida, at a Bible college down there after leaving Bob Jones. And then, because Baptist, you, baptism by immersion, you know, is one of their, uh, believers' baptism by immersion is one of their distinctives, and it is biblical. And then, so, he goes to the Southern Baptist and said, well, yeah, but you weren't baptized by us. <laughs> To the largest so-called Protestant denomination in the United States. So he gets baptized again as a Southern Baptist. So that tells you really that baptism to, to uh, Frank uh, uh, Billy Graham meant nothing. And he never, at, at, his, at his revivals, he never calls people to come to Christ and then get baptized. No. No, no, no. I don't think it's essential, but... Uh, I'm, I'm like John Bunyan. I don't think it's essential. If, if you were baptized as an infant and you think that's good enough, yeah, it depends on your relationship with Christ. 
Are you trusting in him? Are you living? Uh, is there evidence that you are truly a born again Christian in your life? And if you uh, begin to be concerned about it, uh, that you think it wasn't, that you didn't actually get baptized uh, uh, the way that you should have, well, then fix it. It's sort of a, a, a perfection of your baptism. Not another baptism, but a, but being baptized into a particular dom, denomination is not being baptized into Christ at all. But that shows you the, the, the mindset of Billy Graham. He was willing to compromise on baptism to please a denomination for his own personal benefit. And he, he, he always liked to hobnob with presidents. Uh, who was it? Uh, Truman didn't want to have anything to do with him, I think. But he always wanted to, you know, appear at the White House. He used to hang around with Rick, Richard Nixon. And, uh, and the presidents loved it because they'd bamboozle the guy, and he's, he's a people pleaser anyway. And th then uh, he'd benefit from that. Friend of the presidents. Pastor to the presidents. And then they'd benefit politically. Yeah, Billy Graham's my friend. He comes to the White House all the time. Billy Graham wants to be everybody's friend. We're dead. But his gospel was wrong. See, th this is what really is wrong with, with uh, Billy Graham and Franklin Graham. As, and it's the Southern Baptists generally, this is their kind of, they're, they're different. Southern Baptists have, there are others that don't agree with this. Uh, and this is what one of the uh, typically uh, fundamentalist Baptists, historically, well, first of all, they were independent, but they would, you know, historically Baptists you go all the way back into the early uh, uh, 19th century. Uh, for example, the uh, Church of Christ, the, the Campbells, the founders of the Churches of Christ, uh, Christian Church, uh, Campbellites branch, they came, and because they believed in uh, the forms, uh, biblical forms, they practiced believers' baptism, and they tried to, to unite with the Baptists. Well, the Baptists, they were there for a while, and the Baptists kicked them out because they realized that the Campbells were essentially teaching baptismal regeneration rather than the Holy, the Holy Spirit regenerating you. And somehow, well, this is a natural way, things get diluted and diluted and diluted. And eventually the Southern Baptists were thoroughly deluded by uh, filling the ranks with unregenerate people. Uh, and it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And at this point, it's, it's you know, being saved is making a decision. Decision for Christ. This was a big thing in revivalism. Because revivalism, they wanted to be able to save you right then and there. And pronounce you saved. Which is exactly what Billy Graham did. And what Franklin Graham does. So you come forward at an altar call, which was charted by Charles Finney. They were called New Measures. And there was a, a, almost a civil war in the churches about whether we can do these things or not. These gimmicks the revivalists were doing. So Charles Finney had people come forward to what he called the anxious bench. Charles Spurgeon the famous Baptist preacher uh, in London, refused to do that. He would invite people, if they were concerned for their salvation, to come and make an appointment to visit with him privately. He didn't call people to come forward to make a decision. That's a thing that comes from revivalism, American revivalism, and specifically Charles Finney. And then in Finney's, he'd come, you'd come forward and you'd, uh, uh, because you were anxious for your salvation, and then uh, you'd confess Christ or something or say a prayer, and then you'd be pronounced saved. And then you have to go out and prove you're a Christian by your works. Uh, his revivals were failures. He'd come, they, they had a whole area of the United States called the burned out uh, country. 
where the revivals and revivals and rivals went through there and eventually just uh, burned everybody out. Nobody believes. It's the Northeast. <clears throat> to this very day, it's a burned out region because people believe this is this false religion called revivalism came through. Um, Elmer Gantry is a, a, a movie worth watching, by the way, uh, that pictures it fairly accurately. It actually is uh, loosely based on a particular evangelist, a particular female evangelist, the founder of the uh, Foursquare Gospel. And her sense. Loosely based on it. Quite loosely. But, yeah, it's, it's really a story about a, uh, a, a Bible student that, uh, well, it, it, it's an interesting story uh, about human nature and false religion. There's even some interesting scenes in it that, that contrast the revivalism versus traditional Christianity. Revivalism is not presented in a high light. It's presented in more or less real as it is. It's a fraud. It's a deceit. And it benefits revivalists. It puts money in their pockets. But they usually believe they're, they're doing the, the, the will of God. They think they think that they're preaching the real gospel, but the re, what was preached in uh, Elmer Gantry is a pretty fair representation of some of the stuff that's been preached over the years. It's not about Christ. It's not Christ crucified. It's often culture wars, which is exactly what so many are doing now. Okay, uh, but Billy Graham, you know, he's, he's shown this, and I remember when I was looking at his videos, I, I noticed he's using psychological techniques to manipulate people, to come forward. I noticed uh, that when they, he calls people to come forward to confess Christ, what, they, what he calls confess Christ, that, see, it's not about genuine people that are genuinely convicted by the Holy Spirit because they're going to come forward period, if the Holy Spirit wants them to do it that way. So, But I noticed that the, the people initially coming forward, there's this flush of people that immediately come running forward. They had tags on their shirts or lapels. They were campaign workers, volunteers. So Jimmy, or uh, Jimmy Swire, no, this is a different fraud. Uh, Billy Graham, who, by the way, as far as I know, managed to avoid the scandal that plagues the Pentecostals almost always. So, so he has avoided those things, the sexual scandals and everything else, financial scandals, to, to my knowledge. And so is Franklin. So I'm not accusing them of that. But he's even talked about it. He talk, calls it priming the pump. In other words, you've got to get the movement started so others are willing to join with the move. This is crowd dynamics. This is psychology. This is sociology. This is not the Holy Spirit. See, rather than trust the Holy Spirit, which probably would not, the Holy Spirit might not respond to his message, you you preach a, a, an a inane world-pleasing message, you bring forth, uh, most of his thing was uh, about bringing, he talked about sin, but he talked about it in generalities. And he wouldn't get pointed. So it's uh, very general. It doesn't offend people. So you don't offend people. Uh, you, you tell people what they like to hear. You talk about uh, the flag, uh, American baseball and American uh, apple pie, you know, American values. What pleases people. And then, in order to get people to, to move, you have to show other, others have to be going. That Nobody wants to be first. So your volunteers, they come first. People, this whole group of people rushing forward to the, the platform. 
So then they feel free to go. Researchers, Christian researchers, have found out that, that the vast majority of those people are already Christians. <laughs> they just want to be part of the, of the happening. Well, let's go, too. And what he does, they hand out a packet, say, this is what you should do. You know, go back to your church. Roman Catholics are sent back to the Roman Catholic churches. And, uh, you know, this is just, just garbage. This is not the work of the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy People flee from the Holy Spirit because it's, it, it's, it's a traumatic experience to be saved. Usually, often, often, you're conf especially if, uh, you know, how, how drastic, bad a sinner you are. It's like, in my case, it was a crisis experience. And then that's dismissed as a mere psychological thing by the world and most other Christians. No, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Because sinners aren't willing to come to God. They're afraid of God. They flee. So uh, Graham uses psychological, man-made psychological techniques or techniques that have been learned from experience in revivalism. They didn't study psychology. I, I think, uh, what was uh, Graham's degree from uh, Wheaton College, where he finally got his doctorate, was, was in theology? No. Ministry? No. It was in anthropology, the study of man. So the, you're, you're, you're creating fraudulent conversions. If people are coming forward for any reason other than, the, than they're convicted of their sinfulness and coming forward to, to, to find the salvation that's in Christ Jesus crucified, Christ alone, he just says, come forward and confess Christ. Say this prayer with me. Typical Southern Baptist which is what he is, or was. Franklin Graham, I suspect, is also a Southern Baptist. It gives you, that's the largest Protestant. You know, you want, you want a, 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 if you're going to market yourself, you want a, a large available market. So what is, what does, what started this was the other day on Twitter. I know it's called X now, but. Franklin Graham's on there all the time, or his organization is, boasting about what they're doing. Pray for this. Pray for that. Pray for these particular individuals that I know. It's like, wait a minute. What is this? And it, it's like, uh, didn't see anybody else on Twitter, really. It's more about themselves than anything else. So, uh, we're down here. Pray for us. We're, we're in such and such a city. Uh, the hurricane victims, and yada, yada, yada. And you'll see, pick you know him and his brand new semi trucks uh, look like they're they're flashier than Trump's aircraft, and on the you know the, the, this the, this all these graphics and everything on the trucks are not free by the way, nor are brand new semis free. So this is where your donations go, and what is plastered all over the truck is the ministry name. Samaritan's Purse or Billy Graham or Billy Graham Evangelical Association, which is Franklin's thing now. And whose horn is he blowing? He's like Jesus talking about the Pharisees. When, when they go uh, into the temple to pray, they, they have somebody blow the horn before them to announce their coming. So why does he go around from to disaster to disaster to disaster with his his uh, emergency response teams? Because I criticized him on this. I doubt if you personally read anything, but it because this is the job of the local church. We're to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so what he's doing is he's he is inserting himself. Billy Graham's organization, Franklin Graham's organization, is not a church. It is not part of the church. It is a parachurch ministry. He's inserting himself, usurping the place of the local church 
to to benefit himself. Well, he might have compassion, but he's acting out of the flesh. Carnal people can act with compassion because it makes them feel good. It benefits them personally. If you go uh, uh, query people in food pantries and places like that and say, why do you do this? Oh, and I've done this. Because I've volunteered at places like this. And I asked, I remember I asked one late, old lady that was there all the time, said, well, why do you do this? She said, because I was expecting, because I love Christ. No, the answer was, because it makes me feel good. See, charity for unbelievers, for Christians, we don't give charity anyway. We act out of the love of Christ. Completely different motivation. And it can only come out of Christ. If it's done out of the flesh, it is not charity at all. It's not, it's not love at all. It's self-love. Just like she said, it makes me feel good. That's acting out of self-love. I, lo I do it because it makes me feel good. Feel good about what? About myself. Makes me feel I'm a good person. Because I do this. Mother Teresa. Self-righteousness. It's not done because Christ is in you and we love our neighbors because it's, it is Christ, the Spirit of God in us. It's done out of self-interest because it makes me feel good. So, so I don't have to worry about that sin stuff because I'm a good person. Well, good people are never saved. Christ came to save sinners. And if you will not acknowledge that, if you will not, are unwilling to be confronted with your sinfulness, You'll never be saved. Billy Graham does not confront people with their sinfulness. First of all, that's a job of the Holy Spirit. And then people, or Franklin too, and, th and then they come into these places. They are not the church. They do not represent Jesus Christ. They are not coming in the name of Jesus Christ. They're coming in the name of their parachurch ministry. Franklin's, or it was Billy's, but Billy didn't, uh, Franklin is the one, the Samaritan purse. See, it's easy to give charity. Nobody persecutes you for giving charity, for doing good deeds. They come in, we'll come in there, we'll pray with you. You don't need somebody from some organization to pray with you. You pray to God yourself. Franklin doesn't have any authority before the throne of God that, that uh, any other Christian has, if, assuming he's actually a Christian born-again Christian. The Spirit of God's not in him. He's not. This is phony Christianity. Even his father, Billy Graham, said he didn't think that, uh, he, th he thought 90% of Southern Baptists, I think it was 90%, 80 or 90% of Southern Baptists weren't saved. And, and Billy Graham didn't even know what salvation was himself. Again, there's no record, in his biography, there's no record of him being confronted with his own sinfulness. Maybe, the, maybe it's a fault in the biography. But he certainly didn't practice that. If he thought, if, if he had a conversion experience, a real one, he wouldn't have been doing what he was doing in the Crusades, his Crusades. And he wouldn't have been sending Catholics back to the Roman Catholic Church. He would have known it's a false gospel, and he wouldn't have been putting Catholic bishops on the platform with him, which is why the fundamentalists didn't want anything to do with him. Billy Graham has, you know, he, he's, he's had this idea, in fact, he was, uh, I think it was an interview with Robert Schuller, where he said that, that Billy Graham, he's found people around the world that are a good people, even though they're, they're pagans. And he thinks they're going to heaven. Hindus, Muslims, good people. Well, by whose standards? Good people don't go to heaven. Only sinners, redeemed sinners go to heaven. 
if good people could go to heaven without Christ, without the cross, so he had the same theology as Francis does, really. A universalist, philosophy, universalist theology. Which means he was never saved to start with, or he would know better. See, salvation is free, but that doesn't mean it's painless. Being confronted with your own wickedness by God himself is not a pleasant experience. People flee from the light, as Jesus said in John chapter 3. This is the judgment. The light has come into the, the world, and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. And you, so we have people going out there and say, all you have to do to be saved is come forward, uh, say a prayer with me, asking Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, some man-made prayer, and then we'll give you a packet and pronounce you saved. And these people leave deceived. Because this salvation is the work of men, not the work of God. Decisionism is spiritual death. It is a false gospel. Say this Rick Warren's gospel. Say this prayer. Repeat this prayer in purpose-driven life. And if you repeat this prayer and you meant it, welcome to the kingdom of God. Well, when I was confirmed in the Lutheran Church, and they asked us, do you, do you uh, renounce Satan and all his works and all his ways, and went through the thing? Uh, yeah, I, I did. I, I guess. But I never was confronted with my own wickedness, my own sin. I was the problem. Saying some words, even if you mean them, don't save you. You have to realize the depth of the problem. Your own sinfulness. You are the problem. And, the, and your, your wickedness is so intense and deep that only Jesus Christ dying on that cross, only the sinless Son of Man coming and dying on the cross could be, make it possible for you to be saved. To accept anything else is blasphemy against Christ. To say I can be saved by anything less than Christ dying on the cross is to blaspheme God. It's to trample the blood of Jesus Christ underfoot. It is to insult the grace and mercy of the Father. Terrible sin. But God is patient. He may call you again. But today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If God is drawing you, do not harden your heart. He will show you the true problem. He will show you the depths of your own sin. Do not flee. Let the Spirit of God do his work. Love the truth. That gives me some hope about some of these people that could be in process of becoming Christians. They seem concerned about truth. Without the love of the truth, which is a gift from God, you cannot be saved because you will believe the lies. You will believe the lies you tell to yourself that I am a good person. And the world will say, Yes, you are. The world will affirm you in its lies, in your lies, and so will Satan. It takes a miracle from God to save a sinner. Nothing else will do.